The world has seen unprecedented monetary stimulus in light of COVID-19 over the last year and a half. With the rise in the money supply comes the fear that the U.S. dollar will lose its status as the reserve currency and lose its value over time. Well, we're here to discuss this very issue and the outlook on the U.S. dollar for 2022 and beyond with Chester Tonifer. He is the FX strategist at BCA Research, and he joins us today. Welcome to the show, Chester. Welcome to Kitco. Thank you, David. Chester, I'd like to get sort of uh, a background from you about the core drivers of the U.S. dollar for those of us watching right now who may not be familiar with what really drives currencies and currency pairs. Uh, good. Uh, so I think um, the first key driver, as you would always learn, is interest rate differentials, uh, specifically interest rate differentials between the U.S. And other countries and more specifically not only interest rate differentials but real interest rate differentials so interest rate differentials adjusted for inflation uh, obviously that is contingent upon the global global growth picture so if you have economies that are accelerating faster than others their interest rates will be able to rise faster than other uh, than their um, that their trading patterns excuse me yes. and that will allow them to have a stronger currency Okay, perfect. So let's talk about interest rate differentials. So uh, to explain to the audience, interest rate differentials refer to the difference between interest rates between two countries, so the uh, two countries on which the currency pair is based. So let's take, I don't know, US versus uh, Euro, for example. Let's talk about monetary policy between these two uh, currency blocks. So where do you see, let's say, starting with the US uh, first, where do you see the Fed uh, headed in terms of the Fed funds rate? What's going to happen in 2022, you think? So it's pretty, uh, it's, it, it's pretty uh, priced in right now that the Fed is going to lift interest rates in 2022 and the ECB is going to lack the Fed. So that's already in the price of the dollar versus the euro. I think the key question is whether the Fed delivers more hikes than what is priced in the market or it delivers less hikes. So right now, depending on the measure that you look at, if you're looking at an overnight index swap curve, which is sort of a pricing of Fed funds rates going out, you have about two to three rate, hi rate hikes baked in for 2022, more closer to two rate, uh, three rate hikes, excuse me, than two rate hikes. When you look at that a similar curve for the euro area, you don't really have anything priced in until the end of 2022. So there's going to be a policy divergence that is already being priced in by the market, whereby the Fed is going to lead the ECB in terms of raising interest rates. How many hikes do you project in 2022 for the Fed? Um, I think it's going to be less than what the market is pricing. Uh, so I think that the Fed is going to be slow in raising interest rates, but obviously that will depend on the economic outlook. Right now, we got PPI that came out of the US that's been quite strong. The CPI report was also quite strong. And so if that remains persistent, then you would think there will be a need for the Fed to accelerate interest rate hikes, especially in the face of a labor market that will be heating up. My perspective is that some of these factors are transitory. It's driven by supply-driven factors. We're going to see inflation come down a little bit in 2022. And so that would give the Fed a little bit of breathing room in, in the sense that they're going to be very patient in their hiking of interest rates. Okay, so your base case scenario, maybe two hikes, three hikes? Yeah, it's very difficult to forecast these things, David. But I would yeah. say that um, you know somewhere in the ballpark of what the market is already pricing would be what the Fed is going to deliver for what's the market what's the market pricing right now so the market is pricing it depends on what curve you look at so if you look at the overnight index swap curve you're pricing closer to three rate hikes mm -hmm. one of the favorite charts that I actually tend to look at is the spread between the euro dollar contract and the euro euro contract for December 2022 and if you look at that spread you're actually closer to four or five hikes that are being priced in for the Fed. So pretty aggressive pricing in the sense from the market, uh, pretty aggressive pricing from market participants. In my view, I think what the Fed actually delivers will be under will, will, will be to underwhelm these markets. Look, there is a theory that the U.S. cannot raise interest rates at all. Forget two, three, four rate hikes next year. They cannot raise interest rates at all. And that is because the U.S. has close to $30 trillion worth of debt. And so... With higher interest rates come higher debt servicing costs. And so higher interest rates or higher interest expenses would bankrupt the Treasury. Do you agree with that view? 
Um, I don't particularly agree with that argument. I think, yes, uh, servicing costs for debt are particularly uh, will go up if the U.S. hikes interest rates. But I mean, it's not a specific problem to the U.S. If you look at government debt around the world, uh, government debt is pretty high. So the ability of other central banks to be able to hike interest rates compared to the Fed is pretty limited as well if you're looking at the debt picture, with a few exceptions, obviously. So I think the key point is that as a driver of the U.S. dollar, uh, would be the policy differential. I do not think the Fed can sustainably hike beyond uh, uh, faster than other central banks, especially in a debt picture, because what you describe is a global phenomenon and not something that is specific uh, to the U.S. If you look at the euro area, you look at Japan, these are all countries that are quite saddled with debt. So to the extent that these countries cannot hike interest rates fast enough, I think that's also a problem for the U.S. Okay. You have a uh, interesting chart from your recent report. COVID-19 in the dollar. Now, this shows that uh, over the last, well, since the beginning of the year, there's been a close correlation between the DXY index and new global COVID-19 cases. Can you explain this chart? Why do you think this correlation exists? Yeah. Um, thank you, David. So I think the correlation exists just because of risk aversion. It also exists because of the growth differential that you tend to see between countries. So we know that the U.S. is a more closed economy. And we know that countries like the Euro area, Australia, New Zealand, these are more open economies. So when you have a rise in cases, you tend to have the economic slowdown from these countries that accelerates much faster than the U.S. as they close their borders, as tourism, um, as tourism um, inflows fall, as, uh, as global trade, for that matter, uh, uh, stalls. And so in that sense, the U.S. US growth becomes relatively stronger. Yes. And that tends to benefit the U.S. dollar relative to these countries. There's also the aspect of risk aversion, whereby we know that as COVID cases are rising, we are getting into a, into a glo gro global growth slowdown scenario. And that tends to lead to inflows into U.S. treasuries as it tends to be regarded as a safe haven, and that tends to benefit the dollar. So it's really a question of risk on versus risk off, and the dollar tends to benefit in a risk off environment. So Chester, the IMF is projecting lower economic growth all around the world for 2022. In fact, they're projecting uh, for the entire world 4.9% of real GDP growth versus 5.9% in 2021. For advanced economies, that's 45 in 2022 and 5.2% in 2021. So slower economic growth all across the board. Do you agree with this assessment? Uh, completely. I completely agree with the assessment. I mean, like if you're looking at a lot of... Uh uh, uh, if you if you look at what Global Growth did in 2020 and 2021, 2020 post the pandemic, and then and 2021, for many countries who started to grow way above trend, so you would expect that that growth will slow down somewhat from above trend to towards uh, towards, uh, towards trend levels. If you look at global PMIs, for example, we're hitting 60, 65 in many countries. So, so that's later to slow down. So I think the global growth picture is going to moderate going into 2022. Okay. Specifically the dollar. Um, go ahead, David. Oh, I was just going to say, sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to say that uh, this slowdown, is that a sign of a weakening global econo um, economy or is that perhaps just a reaction to the astronomical growth we had last year? Because COVID saw negative growth. And so we had to, because of the base effects, we saw really high growth, abnormally high for one year. So it had to come down. Yeah, I think it's a combination of both factors. And I'll just add, so it's exactly, you have a high base starting from 2021. But I'll also add that if you look at the fiscal impulse in a lot of countries, we had unprecedented fiscal stimulus both in 2020 and 2021. And that's slated to come down a little bit. So at least from a government spending perspective, you're not going to get as big an impulse as you had in previous years. So that's something that's actually quite healthy in my view. We know that a lot of output gaps in countries are close are closing. And so in that environment, you expect global growth to slow down a little bit. I think the key question uh, for me on based on the dollar is, does U.S. growth maintain its momentum relative to other countries, or do you see a growth rotation out of the U.S. towards other countries that are getting their populations vaccinated? and that have particularly anemic growth in 2021. And I think my view is that you're going to see some rotation and that historically has tended to be a negative for the dollar. Interesting. So putting all this together now, what's your projection for the DXY for the next 12 months? So I think the DXY probably hits uh, 90 in the next 12 months towards 85. 
But I think in the very near term, you're going to see some continuous strength in the in the DXY. There's a lot of uncertainty around Omicron. Um, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around what's going to happen to inflation around the Fed. So I think you can get some momentum in the DXY towards 98 in the very near term. That's my target. It's a target based on technical levels as well, where I see some exhaustion from net speculative positioning, some exhaustion from our capitulation indices. Beyond then, if the view that I have is right, whereby you tend to see the Fed that lacks market expectations and real interest rates remain quite low in the U.S., then you'll begin to see interest rate differentials start to play a role in the dollar. And that will drive it down closer to 90 towards 85, in my view. Okay. Longer term, do you see any threats to the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency? Um. Longer term can be a very long time. Uh, so if we're talking two to three, two to three years, no. If we're talking ten years, fifteen years, possibly. In the next two to three years, I really don't see that. So if you look at the, the the BIS publishes this turnover of global transactions, and you still have eighty eight to ninety percent of global transactions that are done in US dollars, it's just very difficult to displace the US dollar as a global currency. That said, beyond three to five years, they're starting to see some positive shifts. For example, the reserve allocation of the Chinese renminbi has been rising. We're closer to 2.5% right now. We're at zero a few, a few years ago. You're starting to see allocation to other currencies pick up as well, like the Japanese yen, the Canadian dollar, and some of these other fringe currencies. They remain quite small to be able to, trend, uh, to threaten the dollar's reserve status. But I think over the long term, you could begin to see some shifts whereby more allocation to these currencies is warranted, especially in the case of the Chinese renminbi, that is a fast-growing and quite big economy. There's also the risk of cryptocurrencies as well uh, in this picture yeah. that you have to take into consideration. Well, does the, uh, does the status of reserve currency, is that proportional to the country's economic power? Historically, it's been... Uh, but there are a combination of other factors. Uh, there's economic power, there's military power, there's po the political system that comes into place. Uh, uh, so is it a democracy whereby there's rule of law and, uh, 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 and, and the protection of assets? So in a sense, if you look historically at every reserve currency that existed, they, tend to be the, they tended to be the economic superpower of the time. They also tended to be the military superpower of the time. Uh, in this particular sense, in a new paradigm, I'm not particularly sure that that necessarily applies. We're getting into a more diversified uh, sort of geopolitical system. Uh, like our geopolitical strategies call it the rise of multipolar uh, pol yes. polarity, ex exactly. And so in this particular paradigm, I do not think that old playbook of a reserve currency particularly applies today. Well, you brought up cryptocurrencies, and I'd like to get your take on that. Central bank digital currencies are an emerging trend. The Chinese are working on one. There's talk of a Fed coin potentially down the line. What do you think that's going to do to impact uh, existing traditional foreign currencies? Well, currencies abroad and domestic, talking about the USD in particular. If you read what the, the central banks have been saying, it's meant to complement this currency. So it's meant to complement fiat paper. Uh, and not particularly torpedo them. So I think in setting monetary policy and in creating uh, the monetary base, what you're going to have is central bank digital currencies that are going to complement fiat paper. And eventually, perhaps, in a world where this is greatly accepted, overtake uh, the use of fiat paper. Already we're using credit cards. Very, 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 very few people, as, with the exception of a few countries, pay with cash anymore. And so yeah. you're gonna get you're gonna get a system whereby central bank digital currencies can, 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 can complement what already exists in the system. And every single central bank that has been releasing their playbook for central bank digital currencies, this is exactly what I foresee. This foresee something that's going to complement the current monetary system as opposed to completely displace it. Hmm. Well, I don't think the central banks would openly, overtly admit that they're trying to torpedo the currencies now. But yeah. uh, I see your point. Uh, I'd like to come back to uh, inflation, your inflation forecast. Now, you said that inflation is transitory. Um, I've heard both sides of this debate. I'd like to get your argument as to why you think inflation is likely to come down from, we're at the highest level since 1982. Um, I think so. some of the factors have been supply-driven. Uh, for example, of some shipping costs that have gone up quite significantly. We're beginning to see those roll over. We've also seen 
Commodity prices in a few sectors that are starting to roll over as well. If you look at iron ore prices, for example, they have come down from their highs. You're beginning to see a rollover in crude prices. And there are a few other key commodities that drive inflation. So I think to the extent that the increase in prices that you saw this year do not repeat themselves next year, even if prices stabilize at current levels, inflation is going to fall in that particular scenario. So there's a supply side of the picture that I think is quite important to inflation. More importantly for currencies, when I'm looking at currencies, I'm not only looking at the absolute level of inflation, but I'm looking at the relative level uh, level of inflation. And I think inflation truly has been a global problem. So it's not something that's central to the US. If you look at the UK, you look at the Euro area, you look at New Zealand, inflation, and you look at Canada where we're seated as well, inflation in these countries are particularly high. So from that perspective, I think that this is where this central bank divergence that I was talking about comes into right. play, where you cannot really get central banks that diverge from each other if they are particularly trying to fight inflation. Well, all else being equal, if you have a country that has very high inflation, that country's currency should erode in value, correct? That's correct. And so specific to that, you have seen uh, that the, the fair value of the U.S. dollar has been falling uh, over the last few years. Uh, according to our models, the U.S. dollar is particularly is about 20% or overvalued according to our PPP models. And as US inflation keeps outpacing the rest of the world, if it does, yeah. uh, the fair value of the currency will keep eroding, which is also one of the key reasons why we think that over the long term, if as currencies do mean revert to fair value, you should see the US dollar um, uh, converge towards its fair value, which is about 20% cheaper from current levels. Now, my forecast is not that aggressive, but mm-hmm. I think that over the long term, uh, you would see the dollar revert towards fair value. The, there is an argument, and I'll just present it to you, that inflation is not transitory because of the increase in the money supply that we've seen. The M2 money stock has grown to record levels never before seen. So that money is in the system. It's going to get spent. Um, we're going to get uh, the velocity of money eventually should pick up. That's their argument. And so when that happens, inflation will be sticky. It will not go away. And so the Fed has limited tools now to fight inflation because they can't raise interest rates too much that would spiral the economy down into another recession. Uh, and so inflation really cannot be fought. What is your, what is your um, counter to that? Well, if the, so we've seen this playbook before, right? We saw the monetary base expand tremendously in, uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, and we do not see inflation there. Uh, so and the reason we not see inflation is because that money supply did not make its way into the system. If you look at growth rates of money supply right now, they are actually coming down. It is true that we've had a lot of transfers from governments to households and savings rates in households have picked up quite tremendously. So if some of this money gets gets spent, you're going to have a demand shock in the face of a, a supply shock. And so that could lead to more persistent inflation. But to the extent that not all of this money is spent, some of it is saved as mm-hmm. well then you are not going to get this particularly tremendous shock that you're seeing uh, uh, this, infl- in this, this inflation spiral that you're seeing that people are talking about. I think what is more important is if you get a wage inflation spiral. Yes. So if you begin to see wages rise, so you begin to see workers demand higher wages and they take those wages and spend them, then I think in that, infl- in that scenario, you have a more sustainable way, um, uh, wage inflation spiral which could be right. problematic, but it's too early to tell at the current. Uh, okay, so to sum up, uh, last segment we'll talk about gold and silver, but to sum up your dollar outlook, uh, growth overall is slowing, inflation is transitory, but the dollar will not crash, right? Exactly. So I think growth is slowing. It's going to slow to more reasonable levels in 2022. I think that if Omicron is not a problem, then you're going to see some growth rotation from the U.S. towards other countries. That is what the Bloomberg forecast for 2022 anyway suggests. I think in that environment, if passes prologue, you're going to see some weakening in the dollar. Somewhere closer to fair value, I think it's not going to crash, but a, a drop from the levels, from current levels of 96 towards 90, towards 85 over a 12 to 18 month horizon seems uh, quite reasonable to me. Okay. Uh, finally, let's talk about gold and silver, the precious metals. What's your outlook for gold and silver, given your outlook on the DXY? Um, so if inflation does remain a little bit sticky, even if it comes down, it remains a little bit sticky in 2000, um, in 2022, I think that precious metals do well in that environment. 
Uh, I particularly like silver relative to gold uh, for two reasons. First of all, I think the gold-silver ratio is quite high. We're sitting close to closer to 80 right now. If you look at the mean since the 1900s, that uh, ratio has been 50. So you have some undervaluation of silver relative to gold, at least when you're looking at relative price ratios. And then the second point as well is that silver is an industrial metal. Uh, I think we're, we're starting an industrial boom that's going to last a few years. Silver benefits from that. A lot of it is used in electronics, but a lot of it is also used in renewable energy. So you have, a fit, you have an in industrial demand aspect to silver that's particularly tied to the yeah. industries that benefit, the, the new industries that governments are trying to develop that will benefit silver. So I think both gold and silver do well in 2022, but I prefer silver relative to gold. Well, you said that gold and silver should do well when inflation is sticky. Uh, wh why haven't we seen that this year? For example, this year, we've seen rising inflation in the U.S., actually all around the world, but gold is down year to date. Actually, not even year to date, but the last 12 months. So uh, wh why, why the divergence this year, you think? So we've looked into this, and when you run a um, model on gold, there are three key factors that tend to drive gold. Uh, the first is what's happening to the dollar because gold is an anti-fiat asset. The second is what's happening to, which is related as well, uh, is what's happening to real rates. Uh, gold tends to do well uh, when real rates are very low. And then the, the third thing is what's happening to other commodity prices. Gold, after all, is a commodity. If commodity prices are rising, all would do well in that environment. What we've seen this year is that the dollar has been quite strong. And so that anti-fiat bid for gold has gone down. We've also seen strong inflows into cryptocurrencies as a preferred anti-fiat asset from investors. And so that's eating off some of the bid from gold. In my view, I think that when you run these models, it shows that gold is a little bit undervalued compared to where it should be based on real rates and based on uh, based on real rates, particularly inflation. And so I think there's going to be some catch up there which is why in this sense, I tend to prefer silver, which also mm -hmm. benefits from this industrial demand that I've been talking about. Before I let you go, does it, does it surprise you that this year, like you said, the dollar has been rising, even though inflation has also been rising and we have had had unprecedented monetary stimulus the year before? Yes, it does surprise me. And uh, again, so I think the market has run a little bit of, ahead of himself, of, of themselves. So if you look at what has been the key driver of the dollar, again, it's been this interest rate differentials, particularly against uh, countries that um, many investors expect will not raise rates anytime soon. So particularly uh, yeah. uh, against the euro and particularly against uh, uh, the, the, the Japanese yen. And so from that perspective, it makes sense. But then again, if you look at what has been happening with global monetary policy, we already have tightening in a lot of countries. So the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has already ended QE, has raised rates. Norges Bank has raised rates. Bank of Canada should be raising rates early next year. The Bank of England should be raising rates early next year as well. So we've already had a shift in policy from other central banks uh, compared to the Fed. And that, for me, is the missing piece of the puzzle, why the dollar has done particularly well mm -hmm. on a broad basis, despite the fact that other central banks have moved in a more hawkish fashion ahead of the Federal Reserve. Well, that, that would be bad if they come out with a surprise. Merry Christmas. High interest rates crash the markets. Enjoy, everybody. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Chester, for coming on the show. Great insights. Great outlook. I hope to speak to you again soon. Happy holidays. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, David, it was a pleasure. Well, great. Thank you for your insights, Chester. Appreciate it. That was Chester Tonifer, FX strategist at BCA Research, and you're watching Kitco News. Stay tuned for more, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.